All right, guys, so we're going to jump right into module five, which gives you a brief introduction on Sir Isaac Newton, and it talks about the history. Basically, when you take a block of wood and you slide it across the floor, it eventually comes to a stop, right? And once it stops, it'll stay there until you push it. So Aristotle took this idea and came up with the, I, the concept that matter wants to be at rest and it'll stay at rest until it's acted on, okay? And then Galileo came along and did some experiments that showed that Aristotle was wrong, right? Um, and he introduced the concept of friction, so he, he figured out that when two surfaces come in contact with one another, the surface of the wooden block and the surface of the floor, for example, the surfaces grab onto each other, resulting in a force that inhibits its motion, right? And so right here, friction is a force that opposes motion, resulting from the contact of two surfaces, okay? And because the friction opposes motion, it will reduce the speed of the object until that object stops. So this Galileo's experiment led to Newton's first law, which is often referred to as the law of inertia. But it states that an object in motion or at rest will tend to stay in motion or at rest until it is acted upon by an outside force. Okay. Um, this is very similar to what Aristotle said, but it's completely different. Um, because as stated in the first law, matter doesn't have a preferred state. It doesn't want to be at rest or want to be at, in motion. It simply wants to be in whatever it finds itself in. So if it is at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If it is in motion, it wants to stay in motion. And that's the biggest difference. So then in class, um, we did experiment 5.1 when Sam in Montana came up to the front of the class, right? All right, so after doing the experiment, it demonstrated Newton's laws, right? So when Montana was running with the bean bag and then he dropped it, um, the law of inertia says that the bean bag in motion stays in motion until acted on by an outside force, okay? So when he dropped the beanbag, it continued moving along with the same velocity as when he was holding it. But then when he let go, the force of gravity began, began acting on it, right? So that's why it continued down until it hit the ground, but it was the furthest one away from Sam. Now, when Montana flicked the beanbag, when Sam was holding it, um, the beanbag had no initial horizontal velocity, so it should have dropped straight down, but when Montana hit it, he probably gave it a tiny bit of horizontal velocity, which is why it was a little bit further than when um, Sam just dropped the beanbag straight. And that's why the beanbags landed how they landed. So you can, you can kind of see how Newton's first law um, acts out in that experiment. Let's jump into these on your own problems. So 5.1. You've started your Christmas shopping, or shopping early and are driving on a highway with several packages on the seat next to you. Suddenly, you're forced to accelerate quickly in order to avoid hitting a car that is getting on the highway from an entrance ramp. You notice that even though the road is level, the packages slide backward in the seat until they hit the backrest. Why did the packages slide backward when you accelerated forwards? Well, while the car was traveling at a relative constant velocity, the packages were also moving along with the car at that same velocity, right? Now, as the car began to accelerate quickly, the packages were still moving with that old velocity. So in order to get them to speed up, the law of inertia says that an outside force has to act on them, right? This outside force was the friction between the car seat and the packages, but the frictional force was not strong enough to change the velocity of the packages as quickly as the car's velocity was changed, right? So as a result, the packages moved with a smaller velocity than the car, and then they started, the car started moving ahead of the packages, making the packages look like they were moving backwards. And that's what's happening in that, in that scenario. Okay, on your own problem, 5.2. We all know that if you slide a block of wood on ice, it will travel much farther than it does on concrete. Use the law of inertia and the concept of friction to explain this fact. Okay. So when you slide a block on wood of wood across any surface, 
the law of inertia states that it will continue to slide at that velocity that you gave it until acted on by an outside force, right? The outside force um, that will slow the block down and eventually stop it is friction. Since friction opposes motion, the frictional force will work to remove all the velocity from the wood. The less friction that's there, the longer it will take for this to happen, right? So when you slide a block on wood, a block of wood on ice, the slippery nature of the ice reduces the friction. So when a block of wood slides on it, it experiences less friction per se than when it slides on sidewalk or concrete. So with less friction on the ice, the block will slide a lot further because it takes um, longer for the friction that's there to remove the velocity. All right, so that's what's going on there. That's gonna take us in to Newton's second law, right? So the first law references that an object's velocity can change if it's acted on by an outside force. So the second law tells you how this happens. When an object, so this Newton's second law is when an object is acted on by one or more outside forces, the vector sum of those forces is equal to the mass of the object times the resulting acceleration vector. And that's gonna be right here. This is your formula. Um, the sigma formula, the sigma symbol means sum. So that gives you a hint. All right, the units for this is going to be in Newtons, okay? A Newton is an SI unit of force, and it's defined as a kilogram times meter divided by second squared. And that's going to be one of the main units you're dealing with here. Also, why is force a vector quantity? This should make sense if you think about it. Your book explains it right there. Um, if you push on, on an object, the direction in which it will begin to accelerate depends on the direction in which you push it, right? If you push left, the object will accelerate to the left. If you push right, it'll accelerate to the right. So it's got to be a vector quantity, and therefore the force must be a vector quantity as well. And then your book talks about while this seems like a simple concept, it can get complicated really quick. But we're going to start slow and steady and then it'll build and you'll see. So let's jump into the next on your own problems. Okay, on your own problem 5.3 states, a man is pushing a car that has run out of gas. If he pushes with a force of 15 newtons west and the car has a mass of 1.23 times 10 to the six grams, what will be the car's acceleration? Okay, and I worked it out right here. So we are given force and mass and we're asked to calculate acceleration. So the first thing we need to do is to convert our units from grams to kilograms. So I do that right there and I get 1,230 kilograms. Then I rearrange um, my equation so that I get acceleration equals force over the mass. And then what I did is I changed just to be easier to see what's going on is I changed newtons into kilograms times meters over seconds squared. You need to know that. So I could cancel out my kilograms and I get my acceleration as 0 0.012 meters per second squared. And um, since the acceleration has the same sign as the force, since they're both positive, then you know that they're pointed in the same direction. Okay, let's look at on your own 5.4. On your own, 5.4 says, a tennis ball bounces as shown in the diagram to the right. A, how can you tell that a force other than gravity must have acted on the tennis ball? Okay, the tennis ball changed direction, which means its velocity changed. So it experienced acceleration, which means a force must have acted on it. B, at what point did that force act on the ball? The force acted on the ball when its velocity changed, and when its velocity changed is when it hit the ground. C, what is the general direction, up, down, right, or left, of that force? So the velocity of the ball was heading down and to the right. After the bounce, it was headed up and to the right. So the force ha has to be um, directed up. Okay, number four. What is the general direction up, down, right, or left of the acceleration resulting from that force? So force and acceleration point in the same direction. So the acceleration would be pointing up as well. All right. Okay. 
So another um, important piece of Newton's second, second law involves being able to tell the difference between mass and weight and understand that. So in chemistry, you should remember a little bit about this, right? But mass is a measure of how much matter is in an object, while weight is a measure of how hard gravity is pulling on an object. So one of the big differences between mass and weight is that while the weight of an object de depends on its location, so what planet it's on, what altitude it's at, the mass of an object does not depend on its location. So that's the whole thing of if you were to weigh yourself on the moon, you'd weigh a lot less than you do on Earth because the moon's gravity is weaker than that on Earth, right? But my mass is going to be the same on the moon and same on Earth. So that's a concept that you need to understand. Um, another thing is that mass is a scalar quanti quantity while weight is a vector quantity, okay? So remember, weight is a measure of a force and the force which, with which gravity pulls on an object. So since it's a measure of a force and force is a vector quantity, weight is going to be a vector quantity as well. Whereas mass is just measures the amount of matter in an object. There's no direction attached to that amount of, mo uh, amount of matter, so it's just a scalar. All right, and there's your formula right there. Um, w equals mg, where m is the mass of an object, g is the acceleration due to gravity. Um, okay, and then it talks about your units, um, talks about slugs and pounds. You can read about that there. Right, let me say one more thing down here. Um, it talks about how students can get really confused um, when dealing with problems that use mass or weight because when physicists refer to an object, they'll they, they don't really say an object whose mass is 15 kilograms, right? They'll just say a 15 kilogram object. They expect you to realize since the unit kilogram was used that it must be an object's mass. So right down here, when a measurement is referred to in slugs, grams, or any prefix unit based on grams, milligram, kilogram, etc., the mass of the object is being reported. When a measurement is given in newtons, dynes, or pounds, it's the weight of the object being reported. So that's just something you need to pick up on and know. And then real quick on page 151 of your book, it also brings up another really important concept. Um, when you measure the mass of an object, you're often in fact measuring its weight and then doing a calculation in order to convert that weight into mass, okay? So if you were in chemistry class and it had a lab, you probably had to measure the mass of certain reactants, right? Um, and you probably did that by putting them on a scale and reading the mass in grams, but it turns out that that scale isn't actually measuring the mass of an object. A scale has what's a spring or a flexible needle that's sensitive to the force that's being exerted on it. So when you put an object on that scale, gravity tries to pull the object to the center of the earth, but the scale stops it from happening because of that spring, that needle in it. It pushes back with a force equal to that of the gravity, okay? So that ends up giving us our, our measurement. Um, so it's actually measuring weight there. And then how do we read the mass in grams? Well, the makers of that scale take the weight and they divide it by the acceleration due to gravity and they turn that weight into a mass uh, measurement for us, okay? So in order for this to happen, the people who made the scale, they had to have a set numbers for the acceleration due to gravity, right? So whether that's 9.8 meters per second squared, and you guys know the value for the acceleration due to gravity can change depending on your location, right? So on a different planet, um, your book talks about Mercury, the acceleration due to gravity is different than that on Earth, okay? So a scale that reads the proper mass while on Earth would not read the proper mass on Mercury because in order to convert from the measured weight into mass, it has to divide by the correct acceleration due to gravity, okay? So if, if that's not already in there, it's not, it's not gonna work and give you the right unit. Um, so this is a concept you just need to be aware of for future problems that they give you scenarios you need to understand um, how a scale works and what you're what what you're getting and how it's being converted. Okay, jumping into on your own problem 5.5. What is the weight on Earth of a 13.5 gram object? Give your answer in newtons. Okay, so since the unit are in grams, we know we have to change that to kilograms. 
So that's the first thing I did is I changed that to kilograms and then you can just use your equation. Um, times the mass times gravity and I got 0 0.13 newtons. That's a pretty simple problem. So let's look at 5.6. All right, on your own, 5.6. A Martian rock weighs 15 newtons on Mars. How much will it weigh on Earth? The acceleration due to gravity on Mars is 3.7 meters per second squared. Okay, so when an object moves from Mars to Earth, its weight changes, but its mass doesn't, right? So we need to figure out mass so we know something that's constant between the two locations. So if we use the equation um, right here, I did it for you, you can get, you can rearrange it and you can get the mass is equal to 15 newtons divided by the gravity 3.7 meters per second squared. And then when I change out my units, I get that it is 4.1 kilograms. So now that we know that the rock has a mass of 4.1 kilograms, which is going to be the same no matter where it is, right? It's going to be the same whether it's on Earth or whether it's on Mars. Now to calculate the weight on Earth, I need to take the equation again um, and use the correct gravity for Earth. So let me do that and then Okay, I'll... and so then to finish out the problem, I did it right here with the mass that it's going to be on Earth with 9.8 meters per second squared, and I get 4.0 times 10 to the first newtons. So that's what that rock is gonna weigh on Earth. Okay, and then another concept real quick when we were talking about that um, scale, we were talking about how we measure the mass and the weight. Um, so I said that in order to stop an object from being pulled, actually, I don't know that I mentioned this, but your book talks about how in order to stop an object from being pulled to the center of a of the earth, a scale will push up against that object with the same force the gravity is using to push down. So basically it cancels out the gravitational force and keeps the object from falling to the center. So that's what the scale is actually measuring. It can't measure the force with which gravity is pulling an object down, but it can measure the fourth force with which it must push back to counteract it. Right, So as long as the scale and the object are at rest or moving with a constant velocity, the two forces will be equal. So the magnitude of the force with which the scale pushes back will be equal to the magnitude of the gravitational force acting on the object. And that's what this figure is trying to point out. So you can take a look and make sure you understand that. Right, and then here it just explains the concept of normal force. Right, So the reason why you stand on the surface and don't go to the center of the earth is the fact that the surface upon which you're standing fights gravity by applying an equal but opposite force, right? It cancels out the effect of gravity and allows you to stand or sit or whatever you're doing. Um, the force that the surface applies will always be perpendicular to the surface at the point where the contact occurs. And this is what we call the normal force, okay? Um, and it's right here in your book. And let's let's do a few more on your own problems. All right. So on your own problem 5.7 says a 3.8 slug woman stands on a step. What is the normal force exerted by this step? So we are given the woman's mass. How do you know that we are given the woman's mass? Because of the unit. We're given it in slugs. So we can use the equation to get the weight. Weight equals mass mg, right? So we're going to do 38 slugs times 32 feet per second squared. Why am I using this one? So that my units match up. So then I get 120 slug times feet per second squared, and that is the um, same as pounds, okay? So the gravity, uh, the gravity exerts 120 pound force down on the woman, and it causes a step to exert a normal force of 120 pounds up. Okay, and that's the answer for okay, this problem. So then your book jumps into talking about friction uh, a little bit more than previously, right? So they want you to understand, if you're looking at this picture, right, that the box in this picture, when it's at rest, the molecules that make up the box, they've nestled as close as possible to the molecules that make up the floor that it's sitting on, right? So if you come along and try to push that box, 
the attraction of these molecules will fight the motion of the box, right? If you push the box with a tiny force, the attraction between the molecules will be able to fight that force and the box will not move. And as you apply more and more force, the attraction between the molecules will fight even harder, trying to keep those molecules as close as possible. But if you increase the force enough, you'll eventually be able to um, overpower uh, the, the molecular attraction and the box will start to move, okay? So this is why friction opposes motion. The molecules of each surface are attracted to one another and they'd like to stay there and stay together. But if the box moves, then the molecules of the box move away from those molecules which they wanted to be near. The mutual attraction of the molecules fights that motion, okay? Um, okay, I wanna bring up another key point so the frictional force between two surfaces and is different when the surfaces are at rest relative to one another compared to when they're in motion relative to one another, okay? So that's the difference between kinetic friction and static friction. So kinetic friction is friction that opposes motion once the motion has already started, remember kinetic. And static is friction that opposes the initiation of the motion. So when you when it starts to move. And this is right after this concept is where they introduce experiment 5.2, which we did in class. Um, remember, you guys should have all the data from both groups. You need to have your hypothesis and you need to have your general statement. Um, general statement has to do with this, has to do with kinetic friction and static friction. What was the difference when you pulled the box when it was at rest, which would be your static versus what was happening to the rubber band when it was already in motion and you were trying to keep it constant, which is lower. Is kinetic friction lower than static friction? Is static friction lower than kinetic friction? These are the things that you need to be thinking about for your general statement that's gonna be in your lab. Report. I'm not gonna go over everything that should have happened in the experiment because I want you guys to do that. Um, and that's what you're gonna have in your conclusion. Did the experiment, did the results show what was supposed to happen? If it, if it did, great. Tell me in your conclusion why, why that's supposed to happen. If the results don't match what was supposed to happen, great. Tell me in your conclusion what should have happened and what went wrong, okay? So some of the key points are that the static frictional force can increase to counteract an increasing force when it, when it, which attempts to cause motion. However, for a given object and surface upon which it sits, there's a maximum value that the static frictional force can reach. If a force greater than the maximum static frictional force is applied, it will move. Okay, so that's what you guys, part of what you guys were doing in the experiment. And the kinetic frictional force between a given object and the surface upon which it moves is less than the maximum static frictional force between the object and the surface. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say there. Um, and the frictional force between two surfaces is strongly dependent on the molecules which make up those surfaces. And that was why they had you do it on bare board and then they introduced soap and then they introduced aluminum, right? Because they're trying to show you that different surfaces can have different um, different amounts of friction. Okay. Okay, so then you have an equation for the frictional force. So when you guys increase the amount of kitty litter that was in the tub, you were increasing the amount of mass, right? So it meant that the weight of the object increased. So when an object rests on a surface, that surface exerts a normal force on that object, right? So it's equal to the magnitude um, of the weight in the opposite direc direction. So when you increase the mass of an object, you also increase the normal force, right? Um, also, the frictional force between the object and the surface depends on that normal force. So the greater the normal force, the greater the frictional force, right? So that should make sense. And here's your equation right here. And the, this Greek symbol, uh, mu, is the coefficient of friction. It takes into account the nature of the object and the surface, okay? And there's gonna be a co coefficient of static friction, which is gonna be mu s, and a coefficient of kinetic friction, oh, I'm sorry, I was up, which is gonna be mu k, okay? And then for a given object and surface, the coefficient of static friction is always gonna be greater than the coefficient of kinetic 
friction. That's going to be important. If they were to give you two coefficients, you should be able to recognize which one is which and which one to use them in problems. All right. Okay, that brings us to on your own problem 5.8. A man is pushing on a 12.0 slug rock. What is the maximum frictional force that will keep the rock from moving? And they give you the coefficient of static as 0 0.65 and kinetic as 0 0.33. Okay, so here's my problem right here. To determine the frictional force, um, you need to use your equation weight equal and W equal mg. Okay, um, so in or for this equation though, it uses the normal force. So you have to calculate the normal force, and since the normal force counteracts the weight. You just need to calculate the weight and realize that the normal force has that same magnitude. Okay, so it's going to be weight equal mg equals 12.0 slugs times 32 feet per second squared, and then that will give me my answer in pounds. Okay, so you have the weight, right? You know that the normal force has the same magnitude. So therefore, you use this and the value of the coefficient of static friction because it's initiation of motion, and you're going to get F equals 0 0.65 times 380 pounds equals 250 pounds. Okay, let's look at on your own 5.9. Okay, on your own 5.9. A student starts to push a 22-kilogram pile of books across a desk. If the pile of books is at rest, what frictional force must be overcome to get the books moving? And then they give you your coefficients. Um, for static and kinetic. Okay, so here's my picture right here. So the first thing you need to do is think about what forces are at play here. So there's gravity pulling the books down. Um, there's the normal force pushing up, right? And then the student is applying a force to get the books to move, and then friction is opposing the motion. So it kind of looks like this. You have down, you have normal force up, you have what the student is applying, and then you have friction, okay? So to figure out the frictional force, we must determine the normal force, okay? So we use our equation, W equal mg. Um, we have 22 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, and that gives us 220 newtons. So um, now that we have weight, we know that the normal force has the same magnitude. So therefore, we can use this and the coefficient of static friction because the books are not moving, right? and we can plug it into this equation right here. And so it's gonna be 0 0.45 times 220 newtons equals 99 newtons. So the frictional force that must be overcome is gonna be 99 newtons. So remember, um, static frictional force increases with the increasing force used against it, right? So this is the maximum static frictional force. So if the student pushes with 50 newtons, the static frictional force will push back with 50 newtons. If um, the maximum force with which that static friction can push back though is 99 newtons, that would, that's what we just calculated, okay? So that is how much must be overcome in order for the books to move. All right, let's jump into Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if you look at this illustration, um, force that the wall exerts on you, force that you exert on the wall, okay? So when you push the wall, it actually pushes back at you, it pushes back with equal strength, okay? So this is the equal and opposite law. Um, let's do on your own problem 5.12, and then I will start working through review and practice for your okay, test. So right here it says, a tennis ball hits a tennis racket. What two forces beside gravity exist in this situation? What are the visible ramifications of these two forces? Okay, so the racket exerts a force on the ball and the ball exerts an equal and opposite force on the racket. You can tell the racket exerts a force on the ball because the ball accelerates in the opposite direction. It can only happen if a force is acting on it, right? You can also tell that the ball exerts a force on the racket because the racket strings, they usually bow back when the ball hits it. Okay. okay. So when talking about the review questions, um, state Newton's law, Newton's three laws in your own words. I'm not gonna go over that. You guys can do that. Okay. 
why will friction always be present when two surfaces touch each other? So remember, matter is composed of atoms. Um, atoms of one surface will attract atoms of the other surface, right? Okay, number three. Man is riding on a horse at a quick gallop. Suddenly, the horse stops dead in its tracks. When this happens, the rider flies out of the saddle and lands on the ground. Does the rider fly forward over the horse's head or backward? Use Newton's first law to explain your answer. So the man will fly forward over the horse's head. So the law of inertia tells you that an object in motion stays in motion until acted on by the outside force. So the man is moving with the velocity of the horse, right? When the horse stops, the man's still moving. The force of the friction between the man and his saddle and the horse is not enough to stop that motion. So the man cannot stop moving forward. As a result, he goes forward and over the horse's head, okay? Four, a student applies the same force to two objects. If the first is 1,000 times more massive than the second, which accelerates more quickly, how much more quickly? Well, force, you know your equation, force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? If, so the less massive object is going to accelerate 1,000 times faster than the more massive object based on that formula. Number five, which of the following are legitimate force units? Um, that would be pound and slug mile per hour squared. Number six, a physics student measures an object and writes down a value of 13.1 newtons. What was the student measuring, the object's mass, or its weight? its weight? Number seven, a physicist uses the same scale to measure the mass of an object at two different locations, Death Valley and the top of Mount Everest. Is the measurement accurate in both locations? Why or why not? No. Um, one location won't be accurate, right? The scale must measure the weight and convert its mass by dividing by the acceleration due to gravity. And the acceleration due to gravity depends on the position. All right, number eight. What is a normal force? Why is it important in physics? It's the force exerted by a surface supporting an object and it's used to determine frictional force. Number nine. A physics student is measuring friction coefficients. For one surface, he measures the coefficient but neglects to write down which is static and which is kinetic. If the numbers are 0 0.23 and 0 0.54, which is which? So 0 0.54 will be static and 0 0.23 will be kinetic. Remember, static coefficient of friction is always greater. All right, number 10. When a tire rolls on a road, it pushes against the road. According to Newton's third law, what must happen in response to this push? So the road must respond by pushing the tire back, right? An equal and opposite um, reaction. So the tire pushes backward on the road and the road pushes forward in the opposite, um, equal and opposite direction, making the car go forward. Okay, that's the review questions. Okay, let's talk about practice problems. Number one. A father is teaching his young daughter to ice skate by pulling her across the ice with a short rope. If the daughter, whose mass is 25 kilograms, starts to accelerate at 0 0.35 meters per second squared, with what force is the father, father pulling her? Assume the ice is frictionless. So you just use your equation. Force equals mass times acceleration. Um, 25 kilograms times 0 0.35 meters per second squared. And you get 8.8 .8 newtons. Number two. A 501 pound rock has fallen onto a frozen pond that you want to use as an ice skating rink. If you push the rock with a force of 16 pounds, how fast will the rock accelerate? You can assume there is no friction between the rock and the ice. So the first thing you need to do is get the mass. So weight equals mass times um, gravity. So mass equals weight divided by gravity, which would be 501 and I'm going to change it from pounds to slug feet per second squared divided by 32 feet per second squared and I get it has a mass of 16 slugs then I can use the equation um, force equals mass times acceleration I can rearrange it and I can get 16 slugs um, I just change my pounds to slug feet per second squared divided by 16 slugs and then I'm going to get 1.0 feet per second squared. In problem number two, I asked you to assume there's no friction between the rock and the ice. You do, however, have to assume that there is friction between your feet or whatever is on them and the ice. Why? Well, if there wasn't, you'd slip around. You'd never get enough 
grip in order to push the rock. Number four, your rock has a mass of 523 grams. What is its weight in Newtons? So you just use your equation, weight equals mass times G. So I do have to convert from grams to kilograms. Um, so it's 0 0.523 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is gonna give me 5.1 Newtons. Number five, if a box of cargo bound for space exploration weighs 1,234 pounds on Earth, what will its weight be on the moon? The acceleration due to gravity on the moon is 5.3 feet per second squared. Okay, so when an object moves from one planet to another, the weight changes, but the mass doesn't, right? So I'm gonna get the mass, so W equal mg, so m equal W over g, so 1,234 pounds over 32 feet per second squared is gonna give me 39 slugs. And then when I redo the formula with that, I get W equals MG equals 39 slugs times 5.3 feet per second squared. And I'm gonna end up with 2.1 times 10, is that to the second pounds? Um, I think that's to the second pounds. Okay, number six. If an astronaut weighs 296 Newtons on Mercury, where the acceleration due to gravity is 3.95 meters per second squared, how much does she weigh on Earth? So W equal mg, so m equal W over g, 296 Newtons divided by 3.95 meters per second squared. I'm gonna end up with 74.9 kilograms. And then W equal mg, so I'm gonna take my 74.9 kilograms and do times 9.8 meters per second squared, and I'm gonna get 730 Newtons on Earth. Okay, number seven. A 745 kilogram box is sliding across the floor and it gives me the coefficient for static and kinetic. What is the frictional force between the box and the floor? So to calculate the frictional force, we need the normal force. So I'm gonna get W equal mg, right? Which gives me 7,300 Newtons, which is also gonna be the same as my normal force. So then I'm gonna take my coefficient, um, it's sliding, so we know that it's gonna be the coefficient of kinetic. So it's gonna be 0 0.32 times my 7,300 Newtons, and I'm going to get 2,300 Newtons. Okay. Number eight, while driving down a country road, a man has to stop because a 314 pound rock has fallen off a hill and landed in the middle of the road. Gives me the coefficient of frictions. What is the magnitude of the frictional force the man must overcome to get the rock to move? Okay, so since the driver's trying to start the rock moving, we have to use the coefficient of static friction. Um, and the weight equals 314 pounds, so we know that our normal force is gonna be 315 pounds. So it's going to be 0 0.45 times 314 pounds. That's gonna give me 1.4 times 10 to the second pounds. All right, number nine, a construction worker is sliding a 74 kilogram box of bricks across a wooden board. And they give me the coefficients for static and kinetic. If the man pushes with a force of 92 Newtons, how fast will the box accelerate? Make the calculation for when the box is already moving. So we need to know all the forces acting on the box and the horizontal dimension. And when we know those, we can sum them up and then we can equal them to the mass times the acceleration, right? So you have the weight going down, counteracting the normal force, and then you have the force being pushed and friction opposing it. All right, so W equal mg, so we're gonna have 74 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. So I'm gonna get 730 Newtons for my weight. And also that's going to be the normal force as well. So um, now to get F, I'm going to take my static of, it's already moving, right? Yes, so 0 0.12 times 730 Newtons, I get 88 Newtons. So when I take um, 92 Newtons, which is what the he's moving it with, minus 88 Newtons, that's going to equal to 74 grams, kilograms times my acceleration, 
right? Because I take the sum of the forces and I equal it to the mass times the acceleration. So then by rearranging, I get my acceleration is equal to four kilograms per meter per second squared divided by 74 kilograms, which is gonna be 0 0.05 meters per second squared. So you have to do a little bit of rearranging there, but it's basically all the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration, and then you rearrange. Okay, and the last one, number 10. A young boy found a large box that he can use to make a fort. He put some other treasures he found into the box so that it weighs 11 pounds. He tied it to the back of his bike and he pulled it down the road. With what force must he pull the box in order to keep it moving at a constant velocity? Okay, so the weight is 11 pounds, so we know the normal force is 11 pounds. So friction is equal to, um, we know that it's in motion. So 0 0.32 is the coefficient we're gonna use times 11 pounds. So 3.5 pounds. When the box is moving at a constant velocity, the acceleration is zero. So we know that uh, F minus F is going to equal zero, right? So it's gonna be 3.5 pounds. With what force must he pull the box in order to keep it moving? All right. All no right, problem. guys, that's all I got. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, make sure you understand specifically the review questions and the practice problems. I think you'll do fine on your test. And as always, let me know if you have any questions. Good luck. Bye.